Okay, good morning. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the very first verse of the Book of Mormon. Ish Nephi, Stamma von Guten Eltern. That's how the German begins. And I'm not going to read more of the German to you. I'll, uh, I'll have recourse to the German as I can, but uh, here's my favorite Book of Mormon, the one my daughter gave me with her testimony written in it. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father, and having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record of my proceedings in my days. Now, you don't have to look any further than that one verse to see the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. The very first two words, I, Nephi. And here's why. In such a, in his characteristic manner, that was so vintage nibbly in his uh, teachings of the Book of Mormon. Again, this is the first volume. This was his Honors Book of Mormon class. Book of Mormon starts out by saying, I, Nephi. You notice it's an autobiography. I, Nephi. Now, at this time, now when he says at this time, 600 B.C., isn't this a remarkable thing? 600 B.C., in Jerusalem, uh, basically the Levant, you got uh, Jerusalem, Egypt, so on and so forth, it was exactly at this time that this style of writing occurred. It is autobiographical. <laughs> it matches. Interesting little detail. When you add up the tens of thousands of interesting little details like this, it screams authenticity. Bet you didn't know that, did you? It's an autobiography. And that's the kind of writing it was. Everybody wrote autobiographies. And there's some great autobiographical literature in Egyptian, actually. Interesting that it's in Egyptian. It happens to be the the learning of the Jews, the Hebrew, and the learning of, or the language of the Jews, the language of his father Lehi, which was would have been, of course, Hebrew, and the Egyptians. It just so happens that at 600 B.C. in Jerusalem we have some direct archaeological and historical and cultural demonstrations. That it's just those two cultures and languages that dominated the Jews at 600 B.C., just prior, yeah, within 50, 60 years, prior to the Babylonian destruction, the Egyptian culture was on the upswing. Not the, pull, not the power, not the military power, but the culture. And Nephi captures that in his autobiography. Well, I just picked up one of DeBuck's reading books. It's called The Autobiography of Kai. K-A-I. Now, now, this is an interesting comparison with Nephi's. He lived a short time before Nephi. He was an important man, and he gave his titles. He started out by saying, I, Kai, was the son of a man who was Nehet and Saw. That is, I was the son of a man who was both worthy and wise. That was his father. And Nephi started out saying, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. And you remember Brant Gardner's insight with the very name Nephi could have been from the Egyptian of all things, meaning goodly, goodness, kindness, etc. It's really good. Then Kai goes on to talk about himself. And he refers to himself as hedge hair, that is white of countenance. Nefer bit means excellence of character. And peha het means clean of body and in moral habits. And he shunned everything that was senket. That is, the word is very interesting. It means black in countenance. Senket does. It also means greed or anything that is evil. So Kai is basically saying what Nephi said. I was born of goodly parents. I was taught somewhat in the learning of my father, who was good and true, and I have tried to toe the line, so to speak. This is Nephi's autobiography. It's also Kai's autobiography. In the Book of Mormon, the peculiar thing of white and delightsome people and a dark and loathsome people, it doesn't refer to skin color. It doesn't necessarily mean skin color. 
There's a lot about race in the Book of Mormon, however. This comes in here already, but you notice he uses those peculiar terms. He was hedge hair. He has a picture of a white face, white of countenance, and he was clean of body, and he eschewed that which was greedy and dark of countenance. I protected the weak against the strong, he says. It came, I came to the aid of the widow who had no husband. I was a father to the orphans. See, this reads like the Old Testament, and this is an Egyptian writing just before Nephi's time. He said, I organized youth organizations of children during the bad times. I was extremely popular with everybody. These youth conferences are very important. We have some of those in the Book of Mormon, interestingly. He said, I came to the rescue of my city in the times of the Awa, the robbers, when they were on the road. These were plundering, raiding bands. This was a particularly bad period. This would have happened. The society would become unsettled, and then you would get roving gangs. These were very common throughout the entire Mediterranean at this time. He said, I came to the rescue of the city against these robbers, or plunderers. He left a good name behind him. Well, we have hundreds of these autobiographies. A lot of them are good Egyptian autobiographies. The story of Sanuhi is a good example, because he was an Egyptian who lived in Palestine. Sanuhi was. You'll notice the very strong Egyptian note here, in the Book of Mormon. So, the first verse is an autobiography. And it matches the actual state of things in the literary milieu of how things were written and what they wrote about. And it happens to be in the two cultures that matter, Hebrew and Egyptian. Now that's called a perfect start to the Book of Mormon. Is it not? That is so fascinating. This starts out with a bang, and it never lifts up. Now he goes on to say that uh, Nephi writes that he had the learning of the Jews in the language of Egyptians. That's referred to time and again. So this background of the autobiography is a very interesting thing. We have a lot of this in the Book of Mormon also. And Nephi is talking about his goodly parents. Well, what do goodly parents do, you see? They teach you. Therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father, Nephi says. He was known the great mysteries and goodness and knowledge of God. The going culture of the time. Tomorrow we'll talk about culture. Oh, he's talking in his class. We're going to talk about some history today if we can get to it. This verse slows us down, of course. Verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, etc. They do the same thing. They always mention having suffered many afflictions. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, the purpose of writing a story, you know, the Thousand and One Arabian Nights and so on and so forth, is to tell what the hero has to go through. The Odyssey starts out with what the hero had to go through, Homer's Odyssey. Upon the sea he suffered many sorrows before he met his final triumph. See, this is the regular plan. Well, that's the way the Odyssey goes. Many ills he suffered upon the sea. The Aeneid starts the same way, if you've read the Aeneid, and it does. Notice this starts out with the fall of a great city, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, and the Book of Mormon. This starts out with the collapse of Jerusalem, the Babylonian destruction. It starts out with the collapse, and then through many trials and afflictions, the colony goes forward and refounds civilization and reestablishes itself. That's interesting. That's the way the Book of Mormon starts out. And everywhere else. That's what I call the recurrent scenario. The same things are happening all the time, and you'll find them happening all the time in the Book of Mormon. So see the value of understanding world literature, as well as the Book of Mormon, is this is a very good check. It's a control on the opening scene in the Book of Mormon, on the first page, and it is strictly authentic. And that's nice to know. And I haven't even gotten past verse 1 yet. And I still have more to go, which I'll include in the next video, on the idea of colophons in the Book of Mormon, and how 1 Nephi 1 and 1 is a beautiful colophon. John Tvetinus, Hugh Nibley, and now Brant Gardner has discussed these ideas of the colophons.